We're going to zoom as a moon. Ooh. Hey there. Good evening, everybody. This is Talk and Draw with Travis Hansen, Patrick Scullin, and our good buddy, famous cartoonist, Art Balthazar. Oh, yeah, man. That's me. I'm famous. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm glad I, to be here. This is my favorite time of the week when I get to hang out with cool artists and talk and draw. So, so happy to have you guys with me tonight. Oh, uh, yeah, man. You're awesome. Good to be here. <laughs> the one thing we need is some intro music, though. You know, some real lively intro music. We oh, gotta... now you're going to make me produce this thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> you got a boy. Put him to work. <laughs> you got two of them. Yeah. yeah. Right? And a daughter now. The big oh, boy got right. married. <laughs> yeah, he's Mr. Scullin. He turned into Mr. Scullin just recently. I have a picture of your boy and his lovely wife on my fridge. Oh, that's cool. That, the picture you guys sent out for the wedding, I put it yes. on the fridge and I didn't tell nobody who it was. And then a week <laughs> later said, Daddy, who are these people? <laughs> and I just laughed. Those are, my, those are my friend's kids. Oh, then a week later, what's their names? <laughs> already up here. Good kid. Yeah. That's true. Uh, that's great. Well, you know, it's it's a treat to have you here in person. We live far apart, so we don't get to see each other very often. Yeah. Usually we see each other during Comic-Con. Yeah, once but... a year at Comic-Con, San Diego. Yep. Mm -hmm. well, table, I... table neighbors. Yep. And, and I did want to say, before we officially get getting in here, that, uh, Art, it's a real treat to have you because I got to say, you're not only the, the friendliest guy in comics, you're, you're my inspiration. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> you know, I remember my first year exhibiting at Comic-Con. Mm -hmm. I carry was carrying around my book and uh was having a bad day with some rejections and yeah. i saw out of the corner of my eye a little patrick the wolf boy he kind of like pulled me in and uh i met you and we talked and you made me feel way better so yeah i remember then, telling you i remember you i said let me see your your book your portfolio and you showed it to me and i remember telling you nobody is gonna hire you and you're like what <laughs> And I remember telling you that. Stop showing your stuff. Nobody's going to hire you. And you're like, what? What? I said, just do it yourself. And I remember explaining, do it yourself because you can't get it wrong and you can do whatever you want. And that was it. And I know that you told me later that you stopped showing your portfolio and you never got your feelings hurt ever again. That's right. And, and, I mean, I showed my portfolio once in, I think, 1991 and then never again. <laughs> like forget that man her reviews are hurting they go for your heart and they squeeze it and then they pull it out and then you got to call your mom and said mom you know i'm crying so <laughs> you got to do it yourself that's a, you do it yourself and you you you'll get it right every time you publish what you want to publish and you, you draw what you want to draw write what you want to write and it'll be you that's and right that's well you know, yeah, it's yeah. funny. We all have that that one little bit of inspiration that hits us like that. Uh, yeah. Bill Stout was mine. He told me the exact same thing, though I was standing next to a guy he was talking to. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's funny. But ten yeah. years later, I came back to Bill and I I said, uh, I said, you have no idea who I am. I said, you were giving some kid advice. I don't even know if he listened, but I did. Here's my book. And oh. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you related. It's like watching the movie you relate to. It's like, hey, I relate to Star Lord. I like, I like Alyssa Milano too. And then you get it, you know. So that, like, you could take any information and make it yours. That's and right. That's the best thing. Yeah. Or you could go home crying and just go drive a truck. So I don't. <laughs> I didn't want to drive a truck. And I told Patrick, don't do that, man. Just do your, and then super siblings came along. That's right. Created super siblings. And you started making strips, the comic strips first. I remember. Yep. You were doing daily strips online. Yep. I would get them in the email every day. Yeah. Like once a week or something. Those were cool. Yeah. Then yeah. I got lazy and uh, <laughs> <laughs> started doing it in more book form, but, but yeah, again, that's cool. Hey, thanks for giving me a good start. Oh, you're welcome, Jeez. sir. It feels good. I'm proud. I feel like Luke Skywalker, <laughs> but instead of throwing a lightsaber, I kept it. He said, thank you. <laughs> I taught you well. Yeah. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. <laughs> well, so, um, and uh, I want to pass the ball to Travis because Travis, we're going to start our drawing with you. Oh, yeah. And we'll uh, get into our, our other discussion tonight. Well, uh, tonight we're uh, drawing heroes. Uh, any hero that we want or whoever we think's a hero. Uh, maybe the anti-hero, you know, however you want to do it. And uh, I'm going to share my screen real quick now. Oh, yeah. All right, share. 
And uh, I'm drawing on a Cintiq and I use Clip Studio Paint. And uh, as you notice, I got my little white canvas and I'm ready to go to town, so. Nice. What, uh, what do you use, Art? What do you like to draw with? I use Manga Studio, but I've been told Manga is now called Clip Studio. Yeah, it's Clip Studio Paint now. Yeah. I was I was kind of confused as well when they told me that. <laughs> yeah, because I get because I get emails from Clip Studio and I start just deleting them. So I don't have this, but now I know it's Wacom Cintiq uh, uh, Manga. Yeah, wa I use a Wacom Cintiq, but I draw with Manga Studio the uh, the program. Manga Studio debut number four, I think. So I'm like 16 years behind the rest of the world. Yeah, I got, the, works. I got the new one. They got some nice brushes out too now that I really, really been playing oh, cool. with. So um, I like that. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you, Art, was uh, yeah. where, where do good ideas come from? From everywhere. They come from within, in your heart, in what you feel. And um, I'm constantly thinking about comics and characters and stories. And it's so weird too. Uh, I get asked that question, like, how do you come up with your ideas? And I like, my answer is, I don't know. They just <laughs> come in my head and I carry a sketchbook everywhere. The sketchbook's with me everywhere. And it's filled with pages and pages of thoughts and ideas and sketches and doodles. And eventually the doodles will turn into something. Oh, here's a guy I just found. I have Giro Man. This is his bad guy. His name is uh, oh, Kronos. Yeah, he's an opposite. He's an upside down Giro. So he's upside down. So he's the bad guy. And I just found him. And then all of a sudden, yesterday, I found this character in my papers. I'm like, oh, man, I remember I drew this like five years ago, but it's just been in, lost in the shuffle of my papers. And then I kept thinking of stories for him. Like he's going to come through a portal and he's going to attack Giro Man. He's going to claim he's the real Giro Man. They're going to fight. It's going to be my, maybe his half brother or his split personality something crazy is going to happen so i don't know like stuff happens ideas happen and ideas and characters and storylines are in my head for years and years and i um i hope i have enough time to get them all out you know because i've been yeah. thinking about comics since uh, since fifth grade and when i was in high school i started writing stories and making comics and stapling the papers together and things like that making so, your designs yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I like your drawing. It looks like Patrick Skull in a little bit. <laughs> uh, there's no facial hair. Oh, okay. He's, but he does have good hair on top, though. He's, he got a good, good, he's got a nice set of hair. Like if somebody, I think if he was to, um, if he was, uh, if an artist was to draw Patrick Skull in, like he come to life off the page, I think it would be Kurt Swan. Kurt Swan could draw a good Patrick Quaff. <laughs> you know the hair yeah i can see that one. i like that now i'm tempted I'll to change it. it and make patrick into a superhero i might have to do that in a minute mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> that's cool <laughs> well um what are the what are the qualities of a good hero what what makes for a good hero a hero has to believe that he's making the right choice he has so much responsibility that if he makes a choice it may have consequences on the other end, but he also has to, or he or she he also has to uh, not think about themselves. Kind of like uh, that talk between Palpatine and Anakin, the Jedi only think inward and the Sith or Sith only think inward and the Jedi don't. So they're both wrong. You know, so you have to think about <laughs> others first. <laughs> like Superman doesn't care about himself first. If right. he has to do something, he'll go do something. He'll rescue the, the, the school bus off the bridge first, or he'll, he'll fix the dam, or he'll rescue Lois before. Well, Lois is a bad example because he puts her in front of everything. <laughs> you know, she's <laughs> falling 10 miles away. I'll get her. <laughs> but you know, he'll let this school burn down before, after he rescues Lois, he'll get her. Except for the movie. No, I got proved wrong. He forgot yeah. about Lois in the movie. Yeah, that's right. And then he had to fly around the world a bunch of times and make it go yeah. backwards. Yeah, because it hurt his feelings. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, the heroes think, they don't think about themselves. A good hero will always try to save the day and provide love and joy and peaceful happiness amongst everyone he knows. You have to. 
That's what yeah. makes you a hero. And a cape. A good cape and a costume suit. I like that. A good belief in yourself and a nice cape. Yeah. You know, even if the cape is a fireman helmet, it's still something. Because I don't think the fireman's going to say, oh, I'm still grilling my grilled cheese. Wait a minute. I need to eat lunch first. No, he's in a go. The bell rings. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. He's out. He's out the door. You know? <laughs> That's right. Even Even heroes wear helmets. I like it. Yeah, they have to. Protection. You need to be allowed to think clearly. I, I like the fact that sometimes when building a hero too, I look at it this way. Some people might think he's the hero and others might not. You know, when right. you're when you're a kid, you know, and this is where I went to my hero, you know, you go to your dad, you know, well, or most people, mm -hmm. some people do, you know, it's like, well, that guy would do anything for me. And then as you get older, you realize that, wow, he's a real person too. And people don't always like him. <laughs> yeah, they do have flaws. Here, real heroes also have flaws. I mean, look at um, Spider-Man. He tries to be a hero 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, his uncle's dying, Gwen Stacy's dying. You know, Aunt, May, Aunt May's getting hit, hit and hit with a rock. I just saw the uh, amazing Spider-Friends cartoon where she got hit with a rock. She had to go to the hospital. <laughs> so, <laughs> but he's always making mistakes. One. Yeah, it was the origin of the Spider-Friends episode. Oh. <laughs> talked about Uncle Ben dying and stuff. So heroes make mistakes. And look at Reed Richards. He's a hero, but he can't cure the thing, you know. And the Hulk has mistakes. He's he has anger issues. Betty yeah, he Betty leaves him a lot. Yeah. So heroes are also vulnerable. You think he They're learned too? The, you know. Start yeah, you know. A couple of volumes or something, you know. Just chill, Why? Right? And I always wonder, like on a, <clears throat> the Incredible Hulk TV show, with David Banner, Bill Bixby running around, he always put himself in danger. I'm like, how many times do three guys want to beat you up and throw you behind a bar and so you could turn and turn into the Hulk? Like, he always <laughs> finds trouble. And I see it happen on the show. He sees a woman crying, and he goes, oh, what's wrong? She goes, I'm getting kicked out of my house. The apartment I own, I own rent. And then he knocks on the owner's door. Boom, 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 boom. Hey, and then that's it. Don't get involved, man. And then he wouldn't. Stay out of it. <laughs> yeah, stay out of it. And then he wouldn't turn into Hulk because he's dangerous. I know he saves the day, but he's dangerous. He can hurt people on accident, though. It's true. So having a weakness, <laughs> you know, what's yeah. what's Superman's weakness? Besides kryptonite, I, yeah, I, I guess. I guess that was obvious, huh? Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think it's failure. Oh, yeah, I, think, I could see that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think if he fails, or if he uh, forgets, or something like that, he doesn't like, live it, up to everybody's expectations. Yeah. It could be his, um, everyone says it's his heart. That's how you attack him. That's how you get to him. So that easy way to hurt him is through his heart. But failure, I think, is the worst. Disappointment. Like he failed somebody. He disappointed his father, his parents, something like that. It's like the, his weakness is really, is real human emotions. That's his weakness. Because nothing physically can harm him. But. You get in his head, he's he gets screwed up. Look at mix a plick, he messes with him all the time. Turns him into a cow or whatever he does. He gave him a horse's head. Didn't he do that? <laughs> or gave him a lion's head. Like, how do you do that? Man, mess with the guy. You're ugly, Clark. What? And then that's it. He's ruined for the day. Name calling's not good. It hurts him. He has feelings. Yeah, he doesn't like that. And then he tries no. to be mean to like Batman. Yeah. <laughs> Batman doesn't care. Batman's thinking about other stuff. He's listening to you. He's hearing you. But he he's he doesn't have a response. His response would be going to be something that you don't know. You can tell Batman things and he says, uh, anyway. <laughs> how's, how's your mother? Why'd you say that name? You know? <laughs> he's, he's he's thinking how to get out of the room, how to kill you. He's got something on his mind. Yeah, he's thinking three moves ahead. Yeah. <laughs> The best part of that movie, that new, the latest movie when they fought, is when Alfred said, the bad guys are on the fourth floor. I'll let you off on the second. He goes, okay. And that was, that was cool. Because we're like, why? Why? But Batman knew why. Because I'm ahead of it. I know why. <laughs> I'm going to scare these guys through the floor. Beat up everybody. I just watched that scene. I watch clips. That's what I like doing. when I'm working. I watch clips of Batman fighting guys. It's cool. He figures it I out. I like watching clips of Captain America fighting guys, especially in like oh, yeah. elevators. Yeah, that was cool too. That was one yeah. of the best scenes ever. Mm-hmm. 
that and really Captain, was. Mer- Captain America's like Batman and Superman combined, you know? Yeah. He's got the, he's got the heart of Superman, but the tactical tactfulness of Batman. He's I got never thought about that, carbon. but yeah, yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. Did, remember that comic book was um when Marvel DC when they when they fought not the not the one that was miniseries but I think it was the Captain America versus Batman book when they met it was took place in World War II with the Red Skull and oh, um, it's an older one isn't it yeah John Byrne drew it I think right and when they were fighting Cap and, and Batman fought and he they anticipated each move and then they just called it. And they're like, okay. <laughs> Remember that? And Captain yes. America said, eventually I'd beat you because I'm stronger. And you you would run out of energy and I would still have some. So let's just call. And they called their fight. And I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Batman agreed. Yeah, you would beat me. But it would take a, it would take a few hours, but you would beat me. Yeah, a little bit I of energy. Remember that. <laughs> and then I remember at the end, Joker realized he was working with Red Skull, who was a Nazi, and he didn't like it. And then he punched him out. Remember that? Yeah. Oh, Joker's my gosh. Like, Wait a minute. <laughs> I, he goes, hey, we're both evil. Want to take over the world, but you're a Nazi. I'm a good old fashioned insane American. And he punched him. Bam! Remember that? <laughs> I remember that. That was cool. So let That's me ask you. Ha- I got yeah, a go question ahead. for you, Art. <laughs> this <laughs> is awesome. First of all, I'd love to work with you on something, but <laughs> second, because your mind is everywhere. Yeah. And uh, but second, what superheroes or what characters inspired you to walk kind of down the path that you chose to walk? Um, I was a big, I am a big Hanna Barbera guy, not to hurt in Hanna Barbera like Goober and the Ghost Chasers guy, but I was a uh, Huckleberry Hound, McGill Gorilla, Quick Draw McGraw, all of that stuff. Adam Ant, Squiddly Diddly, Flintstones. I love all that stuff, and I love, uh, of course, Tom and Jerry, Woody Woodpecker, Bugs Bunny. But uh, my first introduction to uh, superheroes was like Super Friends and Spider Man, oh, Ralph Bashke yeah. Spider Man. You know, Spider Man, Spider Man. That's do, re- that. do you remember that episode in Super Friends where they all turned to zombies? It was like a two episode series. <laughs> it was Probably. It was they awesome. all had all white faces and, and black around their eyes, right? Or something. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. And they were on, and they just kept getting eaten or whatever. They they just kept losing. Yeah. All of that stuff, man. And then when I knew I wanted to make comics was uh when uh I started reading I started reading the comics. Like at first I wanted to draw characters. I would draw uh, cartoon characters. I had a, my dad gave me a notebook. He would, he'd, he was a serviceman for Sears. Like he would fix uh, washers and dryers and garage doors and things like that. So he always had that pocketbook in his coat, the little note, spiral notebook. And he gave me one. And I, I drew a character on every page of the book. Like I, I drew Pink Panther and Woody Woodpecker, Fred Barney and stuff, filled the whole thing up. And on a cover, I wrote My Life Story, part one. And then he gave me another book and I filled it up again, My Life Story, part two. And then I went, I had several of these things and I would put them in my dresser drawer. And eventually I ran out of characters to draw. So then I started making my own guys. And I was about in fifth grade. So I started making, my, one of my first characters was Pappy Pigskin and uh Buster Bunny and Goopy the Monkey. I, and I still have a lot of those guys. But I started creating my own characters in like fifth grade with those little notebooks. And then I just started making jokes with them. Like uh, I was a big uh, big fan of Heathcliff. Remember the Heathcliff books? Yeah. We would get little trade paperbacks. But each joke was a one-page gag. It was one whole page. And even in, in, in the newspaper, it was one-page gag. So these – little trade paperbacks would have Heathcliff. So I would start drawing strips like that. And then that's what just spiraled. And then I would get comic books from uh, the the Polish deli. We used to call the Polish deli hollow hollows because when we'd walk in the, the, del, the deli behind counter, behind a counter would go, hello, missus. So my mom would say, come on, let's go to hollow hollows. Cause he would say, hello, hello. <laughs> so, so, so we would buy the comics there that were in a package. There was like 10 comics for a dollar or whatever, $3, but none of them had covers. So I would get all those comics. And I remember oh, reading. I remember those. Yeah, they were returnable. They would right. rip the covers off and send them back and then sell the comics for real cheap. So one of my first comics I ever found or, or read was where the jackal was scratching Spider-Man 
and he's throwing a table on him and naked Gwen Stacy clone running around. And, and I thought that was amazing. Plus what well, Spider-Man, he's amazing. Plus the cartoon, <laughs> the cartoon was on TV. Right. Yes. And, and I was confused the why the Jackal was called the Jackal in the comic, but he was the green goblin on the cartoon. I was, thought it was the same guy. So, cause they got pointy ears and they're green, but but the comic, I read that for the first time, I was about seven, seven years old. Violence and nudity and all this awesome stuff that, you know, you're like, oh, my God, what is this? This isn't Super Friends, you know? <laughs> so, so then Lou Ferrigno Hulk was on the air, and I used to get some of those comics. I read The Incredible Hulk. And I remember reading Justice League comics, and these are all the comics that didn't have covers. But I, but I remember Justice League because uh, – Green Arrow was in there and Black Canary and Elongated Man and all these guys who were not on a TV show. So I knew there was more superheroes. And then I read, um, of course, I had Richie Rich in there, Casper and Popeye Comics and all these characters. So I read a lot of stuff from cartoons on TV and then these old comics that didn't have covers. And much late years later, I would rediscover those comics with the cover and I'd buy it. Like, I think that one where Jack was scratching Spidey was the first appearance of the clone Spider-Man where he threw him down the chimney and he blew up and stuff. Right. Well, I went at later and found that book and I have the actual, the, the, the book with the cover on it. So I went and found a lot of, those are some of my favorite comics. I think the price was like either 25 cents or 30 cents on a cover. But oh, I was man. a little guy. I was oh, little. the good old days, right? Yeah. And I would, I'd buy a lot of books in the eighties late 80s when the books were about 40 cents or 50 cents that's I when i would go to buy them myself yeah i remember when they went to 75 and getting frustrated yeah you can't buy as many i'll say and plus they made a big jump like 50 mm -hmm. cents 65 and then 75 all within like a year right went, i'm like man i used to go when you're 40 cents i'd go to the store with like 20 bucks and come back with two big giant bags of books me and my brother would put our money together and it was cool but yeah, I remember we, doing that too. Oh, yeah, that's a lot of detail on that drawing. It went really quick. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> pretty good. Yeah, Travis is Travis is Speedy Gonzalez. I like that. He needs to be for all his deadlines and stuff. Well, you know, so, my my deep down my secret goal is is I want to be faster than Sergio. Oh my God, he's the only one. He I was drawing with him one time, and. We were at a party and we were signing the guest book, but the guest book was a sketchbook. It was just blank pages. So I asked him if uh, I could draw with him in the sketchbook. And he says, uh, sure. Who would you like to draw? I said, let's draw Batman and Robin. You draw Batman, I draw Robin. Because I figure I could keep up with him since Tiny Titans Robin. I'm so used to drawing him. Right. And, and as we were drawing, his arm hair touched my hand. <laughs> <laughs> our hands touched i felt his hair on my arm like tickle me and i like oh i got i st startled and then he says what's wrong my friend am i too fast for you and i said <laughs> you're the only one you're the only one who could say that to me sergio and the answer is yes and so we finished so we have a someone owns a batman and robin with me and sergio drawing them together that it's is a, so yeah. cool oh so, how awesome yeah and that's one that was one of my career highlights and and then it's weird because after I met him, I start crying. I go to my wife. I just, you know, like, oh, it's so, so overwhelming. And then he goes to talk to my wife because she's Spanish too. So there's talking Spanish. And then he looks, what's wrong with your husband? He, she said, he's one of, you're one of his heroes. I wasn't sad. I was just like, oh, this is so cool. It's like, it's like at the end of Wonderful Life, you get a little bit of tears. So he came over to me and started hugging me, <laughs> squeezing me, hugging me. And then it's like, I just let it all. Oh. <laughs> yeah, he got I to. Said, yeah, he's cool. <laughs> you know, he got to um, getting to know him over the years. And and he always would ask me how my daughter was doing, who's now married with a kid. Oh, cool. And and stuff. And every time I'd see him, he teases me. He just, he's got to rib me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. And at yeah. the Eisner ceremony, we went to Eisner and he was, he approached me uh, and he just said, congratulations, my friend. This is like the world's most interesting man. You know, oh, he I, is. I don't That's always congratulate. Always but when you oh. I win an Eisner, you deserve oh, a congratulations. Oh. Yeah, it was cool. <laughs> yeah, he was awesome. He well, is awesome. Ready. He's cool. We're ready to switch screens because I think I just finished this one. <laughs> yeah, it looks good. I like Looking Ray good. in the poster. 
Star Wars. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. You know, I figured I'd do a little Patrick homage. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> reading to his you, future granddaughter. Yeah, you guys oh. have. A, oh yeah, do you have one? Is no, there an announcement? no, no. There's no announcement. <laughs> oh psh, no, wow, I didn't know that. I got Stop. room on my fridge for her. Put her up there. <laughs> <laughs> He's got to catch up think, to me. That's what it the, is. Uh, yeah, no announcements. No announcements. Okay, good. No pressure. Don't don't pressure. Just take it. Take it as it goes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's we'd cool. Love to, we'd love to see a little bit of your drawing art. What do, what do you got to share with us? Yeah, man, I'm gonna do it. Let me get this screen share going. I gotta take off my spectacles so oh. I could see. Because I when I that's why I sit back so I can see clear. But up close, it's weird. I got like a four foot distance see, view. Let me see, where is it? Right here, that looks like. No, wait a minute. Here, let's go right there. So I got all my screens open, so it's kind of weird. All right, you guys see this, Supergirl? Yes, yes. All right, cool, man. I'm working on, I'm working on some Super Pet books right now. And this is a page from Super Pets. These oh, are the pencils, nice. these are the pencils I did already. This is page 22 and 23, it's a spread. And the Supergirl right here, and Comet, are chasing the bad guys who just ripped off the the pony show. There was a horse show, and they just ripped it off. Like, why are you taking all these people's hard-earned money? So I'm going to ink this, I think. I'm going to ink some Supergirl. So this is pretty cool. And I, I just got my my edits, edits back. So this right here, these trees are going to be edited out because those are where the words go. I was trying to be fancy, but they said, no, don't be fancy, Baltazar. Just get a see like that. So that's what it's going to look like in the final. But I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to draw some. Uh, that's pretty cool. That is wild. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, I, I've been drawing uh, Super Pets for a while. And I didn't realize it, but um, I just, I was told these books were on Amazon for pre-sale. And it's weird because I'm still drawing them, but the covers are up there. And, <laughs> and I was getting nervous. Like, how can you sell them when I'm still drawing them? So. They're all for pre-order. And then I did a search for them and I ended up seeing all the other books I made. And I didn't realize that, like I drew about 50 or 60 of these books already. Wow. And, and I'm working on the new ones. This is, this is part of, uh, part of uh, the new season. I think they call them seasons. And they're, uh, I'm doing four plus six. How many is that? 10. That's how many books I'm doing this time. So it's four, four plus 10. So there's, I mean, four plus six. So there's 10 books in this new series and there's going to be a movie next year. In 2022, there's a super pet movie coming That's to, so I don't know if it's theaters or if it's uh, I don't know if it's theaters or straight to DVD, but it's the same people who did the same studio that did uh, Teen Titans go to movies and, and those. Or Teen Titans Go. See, that's a little thick. I try to get fancy and change the point size. But it's the same same animation studio that did Teen Titans versus the Teen Titans. That that one, the one that was on DVD. What brush are you using? Um, I don't even know. It's or did uh, you make it up? It's called Pen Tool Options, and I have size at a one. That's cool. I, I mean, I just yeah. like the angle that it's giving. Yeah, and I... Um, right here, I do this circle. Uh, I don't know what angle, what it's like squeezed because I don't have any fancy, uh, I didn't download anything. I just, I'm just using what Manga Studio gave me. So that's, uh, I don't know. I adjusted it off so I could draw with it. So I'm not sure what the angles are because I know some of my friends have this stuff too. And they, they downloaded different point sizes and stuff. Yeah, you can get different things for it. I, I've got a couple of watercolor brushes that I love, but I use them for more for coloring than anything else. Yeah, and a lot of times in here, I'll, I'll draw all this stuff in manga, and then I'll bring it in Photoshop and color it in Photoshop. Yeah. So I have two different ways that I do stuff, but I've been doing it this way for a long time. And it works. So I keep going. And even with Photoshop, I'm using CS3, which I know is old. Hold on as long as you can. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that's what I heard. I heard it's like a subscription service now or something. It is, and the minute you upgrade, yeah, like your 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 uh, your Mac or whatever you're using, yeah, uh, your old one becomes obsolete. Oh. And you're forced to upgrade. Oh, it drove me nuts. Because I I'm using PC. This is still PC, and when I was I was working in an animation studio. We were doing educational software. Uh, and I was just, it was my job just to draw characters. So we would draw all the characters or I would draw the characters all day. So imagine going to work and just drawing from nine to five, you just draw characters all day. And that was my, that was my strong point. And we used um, um, PC. And when I bought a computer, I would bring work home. So I'm like, well, I'm just gonna buy a PC. And so that was, in 2001 maybe 2001 and so i just kept using pc because it was working and now uh when i bought a new computer i just kept buying it because i got used to it and everyone always says how come you don't use mac and i'm and i always say i don't know i know how to use this yeah you so, gotta use what you're comfortable with yeah and it never it never let me down besides all my it guys my computer guys always say there's viruses. I'm like, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't ever, I don't think I've ever got a virus on a computer, but knock on wood. Yeah. But I got the protection, all that craziness. So I don't know. I'm always clicking upgrade. <laughs> um, I'm really curious <laughs> yeah. watching you work. Um, what is the benefit of using different colors for your lines? Oh yeah. Cause um, these are layers. So when I go into like, okay, for instance, when I go into, um, uh, color it and I want to color her ear I could click on this and just color it darker brown and this line here for her hair will be a dark orange and over here a dark blue will separate this red so any line that's behind a line see her cape line is behind it and over here it's behind and over here it goes behind so when I color it it's going to be here let me see if I can bring it in can you guys see this oh yeah can you see Harlequin uh, I have to share no. a screen. Okay, Probably I have could, to share a screen. Yeah, I could demonstrate. I'm going to do it. You do it. <laughs> Don't let us hold you back. <laughs> let me see. I'm going to show you. Cause that's me drawing here. Let me let me, let me press save. Because I save and then I swig. <laughs> All right. That's what I do. <laughs> so now let me go in to share a screen and I'll share my uh, Photoshop. So when I come in, when I come into Photoshop and color, see, watch, I'm going to show you and you're going to say, oh, that's why. Okay, look at this guy. All these lines are going over and intersecting, right? So I'll take, I'll take this guy. Here he is. I'll take the blue and then I'll put, I'll put, see how the purple line goes over? Yeah. So when I color it, I color all my blue lines, see? So then eventually I'll take, when it's all colored up, I'll get another blue one here. When it's all colored up, I'll select this purple. So I'll select this purple and select all, and then I could delete it. Yeah, I could either delete it, see, and then it's a real clean line, see? Yeah. So I draw, I, it helps me ink faster that way. So then so, you don't have to go back in and select things later. You just nah. right there. Yeah. And so I keep going. So watch when I, I go in here and color stripes here, I'll, I'll just keep I'll color stripes and I won't have to work. Oh, I won't have to worry about, about anything overlapping because this line is underneath the other line. But when I bring it in a Photoshop, it's all one flat layer. Right. See, and over here, and I don't work in many layers. I have one, one layer that has characters and then another layer that has uh See now what another layer that has background. So now I'll go ahead and put the black line. See, and there yeah. it is. So when I'll delete this, and then I'll take his nose, his little nose lines here. See now he's complete. So if I go back and tech the pink, and I'll do that. And now watch if this whole page is all like this inked. I put dots here. These are the layers I have. So I have one, two, three, four, five, whatever. And so when I select this orange here and I put select all, it'll eliminate all the orange that didn't get colored when I'm done. And it'll, like I did with the purple, 
So that's what happens. Oh, that's genius. Yeah, that I, I invented very, very that. Cool. Yeah, I invented that because I got tired of trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> and then the same with like when I do a, a scan, a black piece of paper. Or not black piece, a white, a white paper with black ink. And I'll go back. There's another technique I've done where I'll eliminate all the little white dots. And I was showing Franco that. And he was real confused and it's time consuming. And he said to me, I'm not doing that. I'm doing that. I said, just try it. Just try this one page. And then it makes it real easy to color and it seals up your lines like where you don't have any white dots anymore. Because there's always that one little dot that drives you nuts. Right. See through and it'll come up like if you have a nice yellow page, a little purple dot will show up in the background like, oh, I didn't forgot to erase that. Well, I, I got a technique that will erase it too. So it's kind of cool. That is extremely cool. See, and now when I did these red words, so now when I go back and do the orange, it'll come, it'll, it'll eliminate it. And so there's a, here I'll, I'll, I'll color this, this is water balloon. I'll color these lines here, blue, and then you'll see, but it gets confusing. Like when I get over here, I'm like, all right, where, what do I do? What do I do? But then it, it's okay. It works out. I get so used to it and I work so fast sometimes, like I could click on it so fast that it, it makes sense. And seeing something like this, I could click on him and then all the black, see now that little piece there. So now you know, that's all black line around the guy. That it's is kind of fun. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's how well, I that's a great way to combine your, your inking and your coloring in a way that doesn't require all the extra steps. Yeah, and a lot of times, uh, here, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to drawing Supergirl, but a lot of times, when I when I draw. Or when I when I color and people ask, uh, can I work with you? Can I color your stuff? I always say no. You won't understand how how to do it, and they're like they get insulted. It's like what do you mean? I've been coloring for years, and I'm like, and then I'll show them my technique, and they're like, oh, that's a lot of work. So unless I have, a a black and white artwork, but if I want a color line then I have to allow it. Well, to and, be, uh, I, and for what you're doing and trying to get the effect I think you're doing, you need to have it have a color line, don't you? Yeah, the, it really enhances. Unless I, um, I don't really need it, but I like it. I prefer it because it, it looks cool. Once you get this all colored up, it, I think it looks cool, especially with uh, with just the brightness, the colors, and I don't need to add, I don't add shadows and stuff. So everything's pretty flat. All my colors are flat. You know, it, it, it's what neat, yeah, what I'm finding really awesome is listening to you talk and I can tell the Hanna-Barbera influences are very oh, yeah. strong. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is which is awesome because I mean, yeah, uh, look at that I, face. <laughs> I'm a 71 baby. And so, oh, okay. um, you know, I can remember sitting down, you know, watching Super Chicken and uh, uh, George of the Jungle and then watching, yeah. um, you know, Thundar the Barbarian. And, yeah. And just being totally enamored by these, all these different styles of superheroes and the slapstick and the humor. Yeah. Which you don't really see today, uh, I don't think. Not like, not like we used to. The people are afraid. They're they're afraid ever since Ren and Stimpy. So Ren and Stimpy <laughs> did it right. They did it right, and now everyone's like, "What? That's not what you do." So I drew her foot too big, so I redrew it. And as you notice, I don't. A lot of times I don't pencil, or my pencils are so loose. So I just. But this is gonna get cut off anyway. But but yeah, that I. Uh, what were you just saying? Yeah, they don't do a lot. The the one who comes close is SpongeBob. SpongeBob does that. Because he would make jokes that were weird, and but that's what you want in a cartoon. You want something to be something to be strange. It doesn't have to make sense; it just has to be funny. Right. And, and I heard that they're taking away Elmer Fudd's gun in the new cartoons or something. And I'm like, I get it, I get why, but everything is different now. Like, I <laughs> we're in these trying times, and everyone's everything offends somebody, and something's somebody's gonna go get written up and tweeted about if you do it wrong they're gonna call you out and so it's it's different now like yeah. if uh imagine like um if this was if tom and jerry cartoons came out now uh how much how what people would say and uh we were just watching 
Popeye cartoons because me and my wife saw them. We recorded a bunch and I didn't want to do that. I want to, I want to make her leg smaller. Well, we, we just recorded a bunch of Popeye cartoons and we were watching it. Hey, kids, look at this. We used to watch as kids. So the first cartoon we watched was, was Popeye going to charm school to, <laughs> to, to, learn how, yeah, to learn how to be a gentleman. And of course, the teacher was Bluto. You know, he's all in there teaching. And, he goes, and so during the thing, like he, brings, he brings olive oil with him, of course. Popeye brought olive with him. But during the thing, during their adventure, he's trying to get rid of Popeye because he sees the girl. And so he's saying, hey, Popeye, why don't you go do this? And then he does, you know, he, he Bluto will pull out the table and chairs and he'll do it his way. And then Popeye will, will, will throw Olive into the sea. And it was all that kind of funny stuff. But there was a point in the cartoon where uh, Bluto said to Olive Oil, hey, baby, how about a kiss? He actually says that. And so she goes, <laughs> She says, no, no, leave me alone. You brute. And she didn't, she's still nice. No, no, I'm not. I don't want to. And he goes, well, wait. And then all of a sudden, Bluto starts choking her. He starts choking her. because. <laughs> and my daughter's watching this. She goes, wait, you used to watch this when you were a kid? I'm like, yeah. She goes, and you thought this was funny? I'm thinking, and I said, ah. Uh, yeah, we, we did. <laughs> and then she's like, this is, look, at, he's, a, he's harassing her. And so it's really different to see what we thought was funny because those cartoons were written for um, guys in the army, you know, soldiers or adults. And they, they would play them before, they would play those things before uh, the movies. Mm -hmm. And so now if you tried to do that cartoon now, man, it would be like a public service message. So that's how different things are. That's how different things are now. <laughs> well, so I, don't, I don't know what got me talking about that. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good point in that, you know, uh, for me, I guess it's that when we were kids, we watched cartoons because that's what kids do. Right. But yeah, nowadays, uh, you know, the style doesn't necessarily match the maturity level of the audience or vice versa. So yeah. What is your feeling about kids cartoons or kids comics or uh, it seems like, kid-friendly material is missing in in the marketplace yeah the the thing about the kids material is when it's when it's kids material it should be fun it shouldn't have to force it or talk down to the kid like um i always use an example like doherty explorer is the perfect kids cartoon the perfect kid but it's for little kids it's like four-year-olds and eventually they're going to grow out of that. By the time they're eight years old, or by the time they're six, they're going to want to watch SpongeBob. And SpongeBob sticks. SpongeBob is good for everybody. Adults love it. Kids love it. All kids, even little kids love it, even though that if they don't know the jokes. But SpongeBob is something that stands the test of time with every age person. If you're into cartoons, you'll probably like it. Same with that other show, um, Gumball. The Adventures of Gumball. Oh my gosh, that is awesome! Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I sit there and because the jokes aren't just for kids, right? They're they are they're they're very um. <laughs> there's been a couple of them where I sat there and said, "Whoa!" Yeah, I mean the dad the dad shows up with no shirt and he has boobies hanging and stuff, and so it's like it's just funny. They're just funny things. There's nothing offensive about not like South Park and stuff, but it's just funny. It's for everybody, and. The difference is with kids comics is a lot of writers try to write for kids and that's the wrong thing. Like you don't write a kid's comic, you write a book that kids could read. And so that's what I try to do is I write, try to write a comic that is going to be enjoyed by kids as well as, as well as adults. Well, because someone... yeah, oh, go ahead, I say you, you write a book that, you try to write something that's like SpongeBob rather than Dora the Explorer, and you'll be fine. Like Tom and Jerry was for everybody. I don't know I, if it was intended, but it's it is now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, growing as I started my career years ago, one of the things that I remember being told, and and I've taken it to heart, was write the book you would have read as a kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And not write the book you think people are going to want to read. Or, right. or the comic or do the, you know, because the minute you start throwing in everybody's algorithms and stuff, you lose your audience. You lose its power. Yeah. Um, 
and and that is you know if you look at one of my one of my favorite cartoons actually is gravity falls oh yeah that's good mm -hmm. and because it, it was deep and it was it was well written it was written for you know yeah it was written for kids but i could sit there and i found myself more engaged than my kids were <laughs> yeah because you want to see the next one right you know? and and now times too a lot of stuff's written as a as a binge watch mm -hmm. where where uh i watched um i watch a lot of stuff like netflix i've uh sit down and binge watch stuff but i've been going back and watching all of the old stuff like um uh, old stuff but stuff we grew like Fr uh frazier and friends and cheers and stuff mm -hmm. and those episodes are real they're written for weekly programming and it's kind of like um even when you watch a Mandalorian now, they write it for one viewing. And it's right. not meant to binge watch because when you binge watch a Mandalorian, it feels long. But if you binge watch Breaking Bad, you could watch 10 episodes in one night, you know, or, or The Shield and stuff like that. I think The Shield for me was the first one I felt like binging. And then, of course, Breaking Bad. I've seen Breaking Bad about 13 or 14 times. But, but the, uh, but like, the old shows, like I watch Happy Days. I was watching Happy Days on, on YouTube and every episode has a formula. It's like, like watching Power Rangers. And you kind of get tired of Fonzie going, whoa, whoa. That's all I kept hearing, whoa. I'm like, man, how many times does this guy have to say that? You know, and same with uh, Cheers felt like that. And, and uh, Friends felt like every time Ross showed up, he went, hi. I, I, I struggled with, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I started watching what Burn Notice. And by the time I got to season three, I'm like, this is the same thing every week. I'm done. I can't. Yeah. I'm burned out. It feels weird. But now TV shows are not written that way. They're written to be binge watched. So if you watch like um, anything, just pick anything that's new. It's written because they know that you're going to watch it. You're going to you're going to watch like the first three episodes in one sitting. And I really, uh, that's the difference in the, in the way comic, the way TV, the way things are written, everything's a little different now. And I even said after my friends that with these trying times and times of uncertainty, all of these things happening, that we're going to have all the same stuff, but it's going to, you're going to be getting it in different ways. Mm -hmm. Like, um, like even the way you order food now, someone rings your doorbell and brings you it instead of. Uh, you going out and getting dressed up and taking your wife out on a date. It's like, nah, we'll just order. <laughs> it's real different now. Actually, so, we, we, we've been making it now. We're just like, oh, let's try this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's no meat at the grocery store because now everyone's cooking at home. So it's different. I know that's my fault. No. <laughs> Is that you? You're buying all the meat? <laughs> uh, no, actually, I'm not. I'm just... <laughs> Yeah, well, when it comes to when it comes to comics and stuff, where yeah. where do you think the future is? What do you what do you think the best delivery method is going to be? Um, I'm not sure, but I I think um because now DC is doing their own distribution, I think that's going to be a, a a sign for everybody. Like if if DC's distribution is really successful with the way they're doing it which I hope it is. I, I admire that they're, they didn't want to go down with the ship, you know? So there's like, we need to stay in business. So we're going to make sure the retailers get our comics, which is what I like. And, but if DC's distribution is really successful, I think you're going to see other companies do the same thing. And I think it, it could be good. It's going to be different. But I think um, the cool thing about it is that, Diamond, the main distributor, might be uh, more of a of a, a independent comic distributor. Like they might, <laughs> you know, they might they might want to distribute Super Siblings or Action Cat, you know. Oh like, no, they ahead. hate us. Oh, I know right now, but later they're gonna like, hey, we need you now. So I don't know. That's I know that things will be different and things will happen, but uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. They Look at this, like what these guys look like without the pencil lines. Mm. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Nice and clean. Well, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the way, uh, you know, unfortunately streaming is. <laughs> we, every company has their own streaming service now. Yeah. And you know what I noticed too? 
with these trying times. I said it a lot. With all these times, like when I started doing these uh, these streams, like everyone's doing them, but I got my, uh, at Christmas time, my mom gave me this camera and she said, can you use this? And I'm like, sure. And that's before all of the stay at home happened. So I plugged it in and started doing it. And it just so happened to be the same week that everyone, that it got real popular. So I made a few shows and I'm like, oh, this is cool. Let me figure it out. And, um, but then, then all of a sudden I look online or look on TV and all the, all of the shows look like that. Like Ellen DeGeneres was streaming her show. And then, uh, Lou, uh, who's that guy? Jimmy Kimmel. He was doing the same thing. And I'm like, man, all of the shows look like what's going on on Facebook. So it's weird or weird. So I told everyone on my, on my stream and said, I'm not going to call this my live stream. I'm going to call it my live show because my production value looks to be the same thing as all that Ellen DeGeneres has. So we're just gonna, we're just gonna call these live shows. And, and it's weird how that is, that has become a thing. And like, there's this TV show, I was watching it and then I, till I got frustrated, it was a show with celebrities, but they were all watching TV and they were commenting, but it was weird. It was like a commenting, a comment show like they showed him a little clip from Indiana Jones and they were commenting about Indiana Jones. And I'm like, no, man, that's kind of like me and my friends have been doing that on a podcast for a few years now. <laughs> like, this is weird. So yeah, I know it's that. Like, it's <laughs> like, you know, YouTube, uh, you know, all that has taken over every part of entertainment. Everything's. Uh... Yeah. Everything's being influenced by the next thing. And, and I always said too that, you know, a phrase is no longer cool. When your mom starts saying that movie was the bomb, I'm like, oh, all right, mom, you know. And oh, when God. they say for yeah. shizzle and stuff like that, and even <laughs> though like I'm the I'm, I'm the I'm the dad who says it was lit, yo, and the kids like, no, dad, don't say that. So I know, you know, it's funny. <laughs> I know that once once the mainstream people or re regular people, normal people who are not geeks like us start saying stuff like that when you go to your mom's house and say i got some cake i made some birthday cake it's the bomb yo I'm like oh no mom <laughs> when, grandma get, when grandma gets an instagram account they call him instagramma by the way but when, they, <laughs> when she's up there when she's tweeting pictures and like you know it's not cool anymore or it it could be cool but it, it just lost its i don't know lost its coolness a little bit it went mainstream. Now it's time for wait for the next thing. What's the next phrase? Yeah, when uh, grandma gets a TikTok, that's when we're in trouble. Yeah. So, so far, I haven't seen any. <laughs> so I got another question because because I, I love this little memory lane uh, and, yeah. and, and bit. What was your first uh, when you were watching? You know, as you watched TV or whatever when you were a kid, do you remember your first like wow superhero moment? Now for me, it was really it's really easy. It's when Christopher Reeve. Mm -hmm. comes down and, and to save Lois for the first time, goes to the phone booth and realizes yeah. he can't change the phone booth. And then he goes to those doors and, and then all of a sudden, and that was the moment that I just said, whoa. You know, I just, like, you know, that was my superhero moment. And, that, and that so did the guy on the street. He went, whoa. <laughs> no, whoa, he, he, he said, slim? yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> did he call him Slim or Jim? I don't know. Jim, I think it was Jim. And, hey, you know, Jim. Pimpin', yeah. pimpin' Superman. It's <laughs> a bad outfit. Woo. <laughs> I put that in my comic when uh, Jor-El got a new f suit and, uh, and then Bizarro told him that, that am a bad outfit. That's what he said. And he said, thank you. And then he flew away and Bizarro went, woo. Yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, that, mo that, that wow moment is definitely when Superman grabs the helicopter. Oh, that was yeah. That cool. And uh, when she says, who are you? friend and then she faints um that was that moment still brings chills when i see that now we watched that and i still like oh my god that was him and that movie that did it all and the superhero moments that i really like is um in the comics is when wolverine came out of the sewers slashed oh, all those yeah. guys in the hellfire club yes oh that, wow that, that was like I was like, who's this badass Batman guy? And and that was the first comic of the X-Men that I ever read when Wolverine was on the cover slicing all those guys. So I didn't know what that was. 
So my first X-Men one was he, when he was in New York in the snowstorm and he revisits the Hellfire Club guys. They're hunting him oh, down I... with Lady Deathstrike and yeah. Katie Pride with them. Yeah, and they all had red outfits on because they right. were bionic. And yeah. they had limited color throughout the whole thing. I had never seen art like that before in a yeah. comic book. And I was just floored. I, I mean, it was just amazing. Yeah, that was good. That was really cool. And there was a lot of good stuff. I love um, I love Alpha Flight. I love John Burns Hulk. That stuff, that stuff blew me away. Alpha Flight was really good. And especially when, when Guardian blew up, that was a good ep- moment too. Because I was like, I didn't think the book was going to go on. I thought, well, the book's done? They're done? How are they going to continue? <laughs> Guardian's on fire. And then he was on fire but still talking to Heather. He's oh. like, help me or whatever. Remember that? Yes. I think he was. Oh, and then no. you see his dead body just slump over and he's in flames. I think the last page was a splash page with his heaping f- pile of flesh on fire burning for all these 12-year-old kids to see. And... um. Yeah, I remember reading that. That was pretty, pretty great, pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, for me it was uh, Mike Zeck and Captain America. Oh yeah. And some of those early, uh, or some of his first ones, and then, of course, I I think the first artist I really knew was Mike Zeck, and yeah, Secret Wars really rec- and all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, I loved that stuff when I was you a kid. Recognize him real good. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was the uh, Star Wars artist Michael Golden. Oh yeah. Oh sure. You know, and this is good and, stuff. And he was, you know, he still is. I love looking through his stuff. This yeah, is, this is so cool. I, I, I remember, love- yeah, I remember that S- Secret Wars. Uh, Mike Zach drew that, yeah, the first few issues. And then I guess now, now we know he probably fell behind and they had to get another guy to help, but they got L. Milgram. Mm-hmm. and. I never liked Al Milgram f- because of that, because he changed the comic. And me and my brother would always, uh, when we would tease each other, I would, uh, I would say, oh, yeah, well, John Byrne draws me. And he goes, oh, yeah, well, <laughs> George Perez draws me. I go, no, you know who draws you? And he's like, who? Al Milgram. He goes, no, Al Milgram doesn't draw me. Yes, he does. And he's, <laughs> he's a younger brother. He's like four years younger. I said, you, you look like an Al Milgram drawing. No, because we hated him because of what he did to Secret Wars. <laughs> How did it look right? And we hated him. Yeah, he hate... <laughs> Yeah, I was not good, though. <laughs> I don't look that is like so Al funny because as a kid, I don't think I realized it was a – I mean, I, I wasn't paying attention to that, but obviously when the art changed, it, it was so annoying. Yeah. Well, you know – the Nam is like that too. When you read that those first thirteen issues of the Nam, yeah, they were gorgeous. They were just beautifully drawn, and the story was, you know, whoever thought would doing a comic to to make each comic another month. So it was like you were actually going through a routine in in Vietnam, and then oh wow, I didn't and, know that. Oh yeah, so so you start with this one guy in the first one, and by the time he leaves after issue thirteen, he's done his tour. Oh wow. And so they tried to keep that going, but they brought in a new artist after, you know, the 13th issue, and it just was never the same. And, oh. But Michael Golden's work in the in the series, now familiar with Michael Golden's work, it, he's so intricate, but he took this cartoony feel and used a realistic setting and just blew it out of the water. Wow. I didn't know that. I never read that one. It, but- it's a tough read, actually. It was probably one of the stronger uh comics that i had ever read wow i remember when um remember when mike mignola took over to hulk yeah and man i and he was the hulk was sucked into that different dimension or something and like dr strange put him in a dimension and the because hulk was too powerful he had to get rid of him he had to get him off earth so the moment hulk went into that dimension is when mignola started drawing him and I thought he looked really cool because he was drawn different and he was in a different, a different world. But then when the Hulk and Alpha Flight, uh, they merged together and Byrne went to the Hulk and Magnola went to Alpha Flight, I hated the way Magnola drew the Alpha Flight. And it didn't work. I'm like, why did they have to switch these guys? Why couldn't they keep drawing the Hulk? So that was a real, that was a moment too where I realized that they switch artists. Why do they switch artists? Yeah. So it was weird. 
that was like and anytime they they switch x-men artists i would do the same thing but i wouldn't mind it i get used to it because they usually put another good artist on there uh, i would notice the art change there was one kid i liked a lot it was a lombardi is it is that yeah, uh uh, Leonardi? Yes. Rick where Leonardi? Got, where he's got like that little kind of cartoony feel. It's a little thicker and stuff like that. But yeah, it's a really would, clean style. Yeah, he would draw um, Cloak and Dagger. Yes. And the New Mutants. Yeah. Oh, that was some good stuff. Yeah, he was cool. Yeah. I got to meet him a few times. He's awesome. He's like an old hippie. He got long hair. He's got a little <laughs> goatee. Yeah, he's cool. Well, we should jump into Patrick's screen. We haven't watched Patrick at all tonight. I don't oh, yeah, think we man. need to. <laughs> I've been watching you guys. I I'm actually getting... drew another one. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I'm getting this. I'm getting stuff done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I will show you mine for a little bit. Here's what it looks like when I'll pencil. So let's see. Boom. Boom. That's wow. looking great. Mm. Nicely done, Art. So Thanks, sir. As we switch over to Patrick, what's what do you tell kids? What do you want to tell kids that want to do this? I tell kids all the time, you just have to draw all the time. You carry a sketchbook with you or a notebook and uh, just draw everything you see and think about, just write down everything you think about. And if you want to be a writer, you have to write. If you want to be an artist, you have to make art. If you want to play piano, you have to play piano. If you want to play baseball, well, you have to play baseball. And no one's ever going to give it to you. You have to go do it. And that's, uh, that's how you become a some that's how you follow your dream and become somebody you want to become that's how you get to where you, where you want to go yeah. practice 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 well you have to do it and one kid told me like i always get all the time like comic conventions people always come up and say how do i break into comic industry and my answer is you just did and they're like what I said, yeah, you did. You got out of bed, you took a shower, hopefully, and then you <laughs> got on a train and you came over here and paid your ticket to get in the convention to come talk to me. That was step one. Now you're in. You're in the industry. Now it's up to you what to do next because uh, we're all at different levels. It's like a big ladder. It's like a mountain. There's all, it's, the mountain's filled with people. There's one guy on top. You know, you get to the top, you get to pray to Jack Kirby. He's up there looking at you with a smile. He looks like that. He looks like that that baby in the sun from Teletubbies, but it's <laughs> but it's Jack Kirby in there winking with a cigar. <laughs> and I always tell people too, when my art studio smells like Jack Kirby, it's because he's here. He helps me out. And I prayed, you know, I pray, you know, ask baby Jesus for help sometimes. But he goes, no, no, I, I can't help you, dude. Hold on a minute. And then I'm like, oh, baby Jesus can't help me. I go, he must be getting his dad, you know. And then you're like, no, no. He goes, hey, hey, Baltazar? Like, yeah, this is Jack Kirby. All right, he got Jack Kirby for me. So <laughs> he steps in there and helps me out. But that's how this mountain. And then Stan mountain... takes the credit? <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> he might. Now he does, yeah. Well, Stan shows up in there. He leans on me now. He goes, yeah, you need more dialogue. But, but, um, <laughs> but, the, uh, but that's how I tell kids. Uh, how do I break in? I say, you just did. You asked me how. Now you're in. Now you have to figure out what to do next. Are you going to uh, draw a little bit? You're going to draw on your lunch break at work? Or are you going to draw on your lunch break and when you get home? Or you're just going to draw on the bus? There's certain things. You, or you could draw on your lunch break. You could draw on the bus. And you could draw at home. And you could draw after dinner. You could live stream Breaking Bad and draw while you're watching that. And that's how you, be, that's how you do it. You just got to do it. I don't know any other way. And like I told Patrick, no one's going to hire you. Nobody in this room is going to hire you. Just draw your own comic. Just do it. And look, you're still doing it. You're still making stuff. And that's exactly how, uh, that's how you got to do it. That's so true. That's you the know, only way I know. I, 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 one of the things I like to say is what are you willing to give up? You know, I, yeah. You know, I, I loved video games, but I decided, screw it. I want to be the guy that makes them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really, you, you do. I had to give up uh, going to the movies, eating that out, too. And have dinner. You know, I had to give up money, mostly. Yeah. <laughs> My pride. <laughs> yeah. I had to give up credit cards. But, um, I mean, I was, I was poor. Well, everyone goes through their stories of their 20s where they're always poor but uh, i always knew i had enough money 
in my pocket every week to go see Pulp Fiction because that's what was in the theaters. And I saw every every Friday, whatever it was, I would go see Pulp Fiction until it wasn't in the theater. So I paid six bucks a week to go watch that movie. And then that was it. That's all I could do the whole weekend. And so you um, you learn how to eat ramen noodles and peanut butter and whatever it tastes, cottage cheese, whatever you're going to eat to survive. Or go to mom's house to do your laundry, stuff like that. But you figure it out. So it, yeah. So what's your favorite project that you've been able to do? Do you have one that sticks out? Oh yeah, man. I love uh I like them all. I I really had a good time with uh really cut loose with Superman Family Adventures. That's oh, the dream job. But Tiny Titans was awesome. Itty bitty Hellboys was awesome. All it's all cool. Action Cat oh yeah, comics is awesome and like I'm a big fan of things starting and ending, like having a beginning, middle, end. And so far, every one of my projects has ended where I'm satisfied in the way it went. Like um, Superman got canceled um, after issue 12. And I was ready to keep going with issue 13, 14. But I'm still, they let me finish it, you know, with the, with the last 10, 11, 12. I got to wrap it up a little bit. But... I was so happy. That was a dream come true. Like when, when we pitched Superman, I actually went like, they wanted to relaunch tiny Titans with the new 52. And then they asked me, we want to, we want to do a number one with the new 52. And I'm like, why? That don't make any sense. Let's just keep going. And they said, well, we don't think it'd be cool. We're relaunching the whole thing. And what if uh, tiny Titans gets a new 52 treatment? And I'm like, Nah, and they're like, you don't want to do it? I'm like, no, because cause it's going to confuse kids because every kid's going to pick it up and say, oh, look, I got number one. And then another kid's going to say, no, this is number one. And there's going to be two number ones. And I'm like, nah. And so they asked me, what do I want to do? And I said, how about we get to issue 50? And then it ended there. And at the time, it was on issue like 33 or 37 or something when we had the conversation about the new 52. I said, how about we get to issue 50 and make it an epic kind of success that kids book got to issue 50 and they're like, okay. And then when it got there, they said, what do you want to do next? And, and I remember it was like three months that before San Diego con. And I remember showing Patrick too the pitch and, yeah. uh, and we, they said, well, think about what you want to do next. And I'm like, man. So me and Franco are talking about it. Like, what should we do next? What should we do? And he kept saying, you want to do Superman? Let's pitch Superman. I said, they'll never give us Superman. He goes, and then I came up with all these ideas like Aquaman and, T and Wonder Twins and all these different ideas and none of them were good. And he says, just pitch Superman. I said, what about these other things? He goes, don't show them the other things. Only show them Superman. And if they, that's, that's yes or no. I'm like, you're right. And so I, I worked on a Superman pitch uh, for for those three months, struggling and redesigning because he used the new 52 costume and they said they, they want a modern and all this stuff. So when we went to our meeting, I showed Patrick, I, here's what I'm pitching later today. He's like, oh my God, we're crying, hugging. And then <laughs> he's hopefully, hopefully they say yes. And I'm like, I know. And so, uh, and then when our time to pitch and you know, the meetings in San Diego are like, I got, I got five minutes. Come on, let's go, let's go by the escalator. And you're just standing there in the middle of the room and you're all, or in a corner or something, you're pitching real something. So I, I worked on this book. I had like 30 pages, a book, a portfolio, 30 pages in it. And Dan DiDio, I gave it to him and he looks through it, 40 seconds. He looks through and he goes, looks great. Let's do it. Like, really? He goes, <laughs> he goes yeah. I go, you didn't even read it. Nah, I don't have to. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, you know a lot about Superman. So wait, I know you could do a good job. It's like, wow. He, <laughs> that was it. And so we came back with big smiles. And that was, that was like the biggest wow moment that, that moment. And um, when I went to, um, I went to visit the DC comics office one time and I showed one of my editors, uh, my sketches for super pets. And I just showed him like, Hey, look at what I've been drawing. And so, but three months later, four months later, whatever it was, I was at a party and the same guy came up to me and other people. And he said, uh, hey, we really like your pitch 
I'm like, uh, what pitch? And he goes, you pitched a Super Pets. I go, when? He goes, oh, in the office. I'm like, oh, yeah. Because I, I showed him drawings and he says, can I have these? I go, sure. I gave them to him because that's what you do. Can I have them? Yes. Yes, editor of DC Comics, you can have my artwork. And so, <laughs> so it turned out, he goes, we're going to do a 24 Super Pet book series. I'm like, what? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, whoa. So that was nuts too. That blew my mind because I wasn't expecting that at all. And then oh, I, wow. I've been drawn. Yeah, I've been drawn ass since. You know, so, since since you brought kind of weird, brought that up. Um, you know, I, I'm really interested in hearing about your uh, your writing process with your teammate Franco. You know, you yeah. guys work <laughs> in like the dynamic duo of kids comics. You know, it's interesting to hear how you guys create together. We um we write lately. We've been writing a lot of stuff separately on our own. I have a lot of my own project and he has a lot of his stuff. But when we were doing Tiny Titans and Superman and, and uh, Action Cat and all this stuff, we would talk just like we're doing now. We would just uh, do Skype. And at first we would write on the phone and I had to get a Bluetooth earpiece. When I had a flip phone, I had a Bluetooth earpiece and, and our phone bills were outrageous because we would talk every day, like uh, high school girls, you know, we would talk. <laughs> Talk about boys, talk about our teachers, stuff like that. And so we would talk all night, like four or five hours a night. And we were writing Tiny Titans that way. But we talk about stuff and we talk about stories and we'd laugh. But meanwhile, I'm drawing. I'm usually drawing and he's making notes. And so he'll send me, he'll type up the notes and just send me all the notes. And then I'll break down all the notes into thumbnail sketches. And then that's it. It turns into a comic. And that we've been doing that way for years. And with Superman, Superman family, we got a little bit more, um, more long form. So we would write paragraphs instead. And then that's just how it goes. And the way I continue to write is I never typed anything ever. I always just put it in my sketchbook and write in my sketchbook, put thumbnails in my sketchbook. And I just finished up Drew and Jot. I mean, I just finished up Gilbert, Gilbert the Little Merman, number three, and book three. And I write the whole story. I, I make notes, but I put the whole story in little thumbnails. And that's the way I've been writing for years, and I've always written that way. And same with uh, Drew and Jot. I'm working on Drew and Jot with Boom Studios. I'm working on book two. And that one's all written in crayon and drawn real sloppy. It's kind of cool. It's a different style for me. It's like my crayon drawings come to life in a comic. I made a comic book about about a kid drawing a comic book. So it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind that's of fun. Like, that's like uh, full circle because one of the things yeah. I know you're most known for is your $1 drawings. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody comes up for a quick crayon drawing from Art and Franco. Yeah. And now you're using that as the style for... Yeah. It was weird because um, when my son was born, you know when the babies are real tiny and you can put them on a the couch and they don't move? You can put, especially if you roll a little towel next to him, he's not going to roll over. Well, he was tiny. He was four months old, a real little guy. And so I'm watching him. And before and I sit down to watch him, he's taking a nap. And, and I got my a notebook paper out. It was a, a pad of paper, a yellow legal pad. And I got crayons and markers. And I thought to myself, I said, famous cartoonist self? Well, I wasn't famous cartoonist yet because it was this was early 2000s. <laughs> so, so I'm sitting there <laughs> thinking, self, I bet you you can't make a whole comic book before he wakes up. I'm like, yes, I could. So I challenged myself. And so I drew this thing. Whatever came to my top of my head, I just drew it real quick, real sloppy, and it looked like a little kid made it. And just like the crayon drawings, real sloppy, and I colored it with crayons. And I got to like... um about 12 pages or so. And and then he woke up and I got to burp him and all that stuff and change his diaper. He was real little. And so I just put that, when I moved to my house, you know, two years later we moved and I filed it in a drawer. And so about, about two years ago, three years ago, Boom Studios asked me to, uh, uh, they wanted to publish something of mine. They asked me if I had anything to pitch them. So meanwhile, I've been pitching a lot of my own ideas to, action lab and to paper cuts 
and Paper mm -hmm. Cuts picked up Gilbert, and Action Lab picked up my superheroes' powers in action, and Big Alien Moon Crush, and I'm like, man, all the stuff I wanted to pitch to people I already did, so I'm looking, I'm like, wait, I remember that Drew and Jot story. It was called The Adventures of Drew and Jot, the Protectors of the Universe, and then I, I scanned all of the crayon drawings, <laughs> <laughs> and I sent it to him, and I told him, this is a story of a kid who has a sketchbook, and him and his friend change trade sketchbooks and they finish the stories and they draw together and i just sent it to them and they they loved it and they i got a three book deal out of the thing so it's kind of like <laughs> wow that was weird like and t to me in my head like nothing i create goes to waste like even if it's not a good idea i save it like so maybe i could use it later like i found this bad guy for gear man i'm gonna use him now because i forgot i did it but i was in my papers i had a stack of papers on my floor on a table over here and I just was going through them, sorting them. And a lot of it's receipts or like, uh, it said 2015 San Diego Comic-Con. So I think I could throw that away. You know, I had papers in there from that. Like, you've been approved <laughs> 2014. I'm like, oh, I think I'm, I'm good. And so that's how long that papers have been there. But this guy was in there. And so I like anything you create or draw can always be used eventually somewhere. And uh, I don't throw away anything. And every idea I, I have, I think could be, twisted enough or or, or or tweaked enough to become some something you know something usable so it's kind of fun that's awesome very very cool yeah yes so sir that's what happened with drew and jot yeah well that's that's looking good patrick oh that looks really cool oh, thanks just Is that uh, mr and mrs scullin yep <laughs> <laughs> she's got an angry look on her face and looks like she's gonna smack you in the back of the head <laughs> yeah she's saying hurry up <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's cool. Very, very cool. Well, nice. um, let's do one quick switch to see what everybody else has worked on one last bit, and oh, then we and I then know. we'll we'll let uh, Patrick do his thing. He asked a couple more questions, and yeah. So I just did a um, a quick Superman. Nice. nice. <laughs> so just uh, had a little fun with it. So. Uh, Quick question. Favorite Superman? My favorite Superman? Yeah. Is always Reeve. It's Christopher Reeve. Yeah. 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 Uh, I guess that, that's an easy question. That's who I grew up with. That's who I remember. I mean, I, George Reeves, I remember too, but that was black and white. This Christopher Reeve was in full color. Yeah. You I know? like Christopher Reeve and, and John Byrne Superman. Those are my, my, my favorite. Yeah. I, I'm right there with you. Yeah. Uh, what are you doing, Art? Oh yeah, I'm. I just uh, minimized the uh, the horse. <laughs> so I'm going to show you horse. <laughs> the horse. I'm going to show you my uh, one finished page of the Archimaniacs, which hopefully I don't get in trouble. Oh, it's... that's it. He's saying he's walking around. I'm going to go. I'm going to go big. This. this is awesome, man. Walking around, saying he's walking around. He gets over here. Ah, man, bad sake. Hey. And he goes, a bat? A man bat. <laughs> a man bat? Yeah, my name is Manny. And then over here, this is the cool panel. I got it. Here's how I want kids to read this. Ready? It goes like this. How you doing? Um, wings? What? Wings. You need wings. I can get you wings. Hold on. Real fast, I want that. But I want his voice to be like, it's all right, it's all right. What are you doing? <laughs> like, what are you doing? Huh? Wings. What? Wings. I need, you need wings. I can get you wings. Hold on. That's what I want. <laughs> and then, I'm, and then I'm waiting for him to go, sorry. <laughs> sorry. He says that earlier. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry it's to disturb right. your vampire hour. Sorry. It's all right. <laughs> yeah. This is page 106. So I feel the pain with the 120 page graphic novels. Woo. Yeah, well, that's, the, that's the hardest thing now, man. Uh, there's no more monthly books, especially with kids books, all ages. They're all 80 pages, 120 pages. And yeah. Drew and Jot is 200 pages. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I was thinking cool. that looking at, looking at the way you work, I've always thought you have your own Marvel style. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you draw it and then you go in and dialogue it, and it's all for your, it's all you. You're yeah, the Kirby. That's me you're, talking. The, you're the Lee and the Kirby. You know, yeah. you're both. <laughs> I was telling my kids that, of like, they were asking, well, how, 
why does it take so long? And I said, if you really want to know, I'll tell you. But if I'm going to start talking and you're going to look at your phone, I'm not going to tell you. And they're like, okay, we want to know. I said, because back in the day, I hate saying that. It's, everything starts on a rap song, back in the day. But no, l long, long ago in early days of comics, you had a writer. You had another guy who was the penciler, another guy who was the inker, another guy who was the letterer, another guy who was the colorist. And so one guy would pencil a page, pass to the inker, and then he'd work on page two. By the time he gets to page 10, he's got 10 pages. The first nine pages are finished. Okay. Well, me, <laughs> I got to do it all. Like I, I do it. I told the kids, I do it all myself. I, I pencil it. I write it. I pencil it. I ink it. I color it. I letter it. And then I send it in. They're like, oh. So, and then they're all like, well, why, why don't you get more guys? I said, because then my page rate goes down a whole bunch. <laughs> my book split rate. It. Yeah, I, like, oh. I tell, I tell people, I just don't want to share anymore. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Plus, it doesn't come out the way you want it to, you know? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they don't know how to work with me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this has been a real treat, Art. We, yeah, we love having you tonight. This has been great. It's been um, fun. I, I have one final question that I ask everybody. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm real curious to hear your answer. And the question is, the wrap-up question is, why do you make art, Art? Ooh. This is all I know how to do. I've done everything in my life. I've drove trucks. I've cleaned bathrooms. I stock shelves. I... Uh, was a cashier. I delivered parts and I didn't enjoy any of that. And this is all, this is all, this is everything. This is all I know how to do. And all the stuff I have in my head, all the stories, I think people need to see it. I need to get it out there. And once it's done, I think I could be done, but it's not going to be done. It's, I got too much. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you'll no. ever run out. No. Cause I keep creating new guys and finding new guys and, yeah, I need to do it. If I don't do it, I'm not going to be right. Something's going to be wrong. Like, uh, maybe I'll be on a beach eating tacos or something. That's it. I don't know what else to do. There was a movie. There was a movie we saw with uh, William Defoe was on an island with all the retired Vietnam guys. Or they had, oh, that's right. It was born on the 4th of July, that movie with Tom Cruise. Oh. Remember when they all lost their legs, so they went to this island and pretended to have a good time and nobody could walk? I would find I would find a place like that, like all old, old cartoonists who don't, don't want to draw anymore, and it's the Couldn't only place anymore. they can live. Yeah, like you It'd could go like there that and not. Great Larson cartoon. <laughs> yeah. you don't have to worry oh, about oh, the boneless chicken farm. Yeah, <laughs> yes. like like you could like you could go to this island and not have to worry. You just live every day is ninety degrees. You just eat bananas off the tree. You don't have to worry about paying your bills. You know, your wife and kids don't know where you are. You know, that's the ultimate goal. But if I can't do that, I got to draw stuff. I got to make, <laughs> make artwork. If I wasn't making comics, I'd probably be painting all, every day. Painting or sculpting or doing something. So, so I was trained artistic. as a painter at first. When I went to school, they trained me to be a painter. And um, I was trying to get trained to be a cartoonist. And in my school, they said, you're not going to make it in cartooning until you're 40 years old. So I taught them, I got like, I was 39 when they called me for Tiny Titans. <laughs> to show them. Yeah, that's, <laughs> right. that's right. No younger than Kirby. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, I think, I think your, your name says it all. Your art. That's right. Famous you, cartoonist. It, yeah, and it's, uh, you're the embodiment of the whole thing. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So, boy, again, real treat. Thank you for spending the evening with us. Uh, Travis, you got anything you want to say to wrap up? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's good. No, no, actually, it was a blast. Uh, you know, I, I love getting this chance to meet other creators and see how they approach stuff and and just talk, you know. And, mm -hmm. and I think there's so much value in that, you know, uh, as people realize that you don't have to be a, a single style to – create comics and yeah. make it big you could do it at any style any and it comes down to i it, it was funny listening to you talk and realizing man how much of a kindred spirit i feel toward you because all the same things as i believe you know i, I yeah. stopped going to movies i stopped playing games i i um 
You have to be poor. (laughs) Yeah, you have to be poor and you have to get more roommates. That's all it is. Yeah, I just had more (laughs) kids, put them to work. (laughs) (laughs) But but it it was it came down to a very simple phrase was how bad do you want it? Yeah. And and that's I think what makes or breaks a lot of the artists that come into the industry. Most of them disappear after five years because they really didn't want it bad enough. They didn't make their million dollars. Right. And you know what? I listen to a lot of uh, documentaries, like guys like George Lucas or John Carpenter and Steven Spielberg, when they made their first movies, when Jaws and Jaws Halloween and Star Wars, each one of those guys went through divorces. They mortgaged their houses. Their friends left them. They were never, they never went home. They were all living in Tunisia, wherever they were doing, filming their movies. And they went through a lot of times and they put all their heart and soul into the movies and none of the studios wanted to trust them. They wanted to cancel their movies. But then when the movies came out, those are the three of the best movies ever made in the history of movies. And so when you have a, a, an artist who believes in his dream and he does it his way or her way, their way, any way they can do it, the movie's going to come out perfect. Your comic book's going to come out perfect and your song is going to be beautiful. So that's uh that's what you have to do you have to sacrifice and follow it and don't take no for an answer if they don't want it you just do it yourself <laughs> right that's awesome. yeah Amen. And what i really like i really like your floating rock whales too oh thank you so cool <laughs> yeah, i want to put them in my book yeah <laughs> go ahead i don't care <laughs> <It's a> crossover <laughs> that's a cool crossover <laughs> yeah so it's just the whales let us everyone know it's the same universe <laughs> well you know i decided in, in between books i like you i had so many ideas i still do yeah so i would do prints and not like i didn't oh, want to cool. do superman print i would do a print of a scene that i would have in a book in my head get yeah. it printed uh, dual purpose one to say oh, well i did this at this time and two it the idea was out and it allows me to revisit it later yeah and you own it yeah that's the best like um now when uh when you make prints you got to be careful to make sure it's your character and all this stuff and and uh when i do my live morning shows and these drawing shows i use my son's music for the background and it's real cool and even if it comes down to that you got to own everything so when you play the music you don't get copyright struck and all that stuff Oh yeah, Lots. but like as then long you as you own it, you're free. To the sun. Yeah, I just give him twenty bucks. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> I buy him some food. Yeah. Yeah, no, I just say, hey, look, the kitchen's over there. You get to eat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, how do you like those shoes and socks? Those good. Yeah. You yeah. Like that bed over there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> and if you're That's lucky, cool. I'll drive you over to the mall later. <laughs> <laughs> buy you some ice cream. <laughs> Depending how I feel, yeah. <laughs> That's oh, cool. Boy. You guys are three, awesome. Three old dads here sitting. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. I like that. Well, well, yeah. Speaking of which, it's it's probably time to get back to some family time. So, well, yeah, you need to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> it was really Patrick saying is, "Wow, it's late, and my bedtime was eight thirty. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I know. Uh, well, geez, thanks again. Thanks for listening, everybody. This yeah. has been a fun show. So, take care, you guys. Thanks for playing. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for having. You guys me. are awesome. You're a good man, guys. Thanks, Travis. <laughs> I'm gonna hang out with you one day. I hope so, man. Cool, man. I hope so. <laughs>